Welcome back. My guest today has spent the better part of the last 20 years shaping a career in service. She's helped grow her nonprofit to eight in-country sites, helped thousands and thousands of students, and the organization brings in millions of dollars a year to help with projects such as construction, medical, education, and water, just to name a few. She's a Rotarian, She's a lifelong humanitarian, and she is a beautiful human being inside and out. Judy Zone is the founder of YouthLink, a program which creates lifetime humanitarians. Welcome to episode two of Beyond Great with me, David James. I'm ready. Judy. Hi. Good to see you. It's good to see Let's you too. Let's take a drive. Okay. You look beautiful as always. Oh, you're t way too nice to me. It's true. You're, you're like, you're one of those people, like my wife's the same way, like you guys get more beautiful as you age. You know, people have said that to me. It's a good thing. Because when you look at pictures of me as a kid, or not a kid, but as a teenager, I don't think I look as pretty as I looked when I was grown up. It's like I grew into well, I like whatever most, it was. You're I gonna was be gonna critical be. on yourself more than anybody. True, that's true. So, what have you been up to? Like you're retired. I'm now, retired. Right? It's so wonderful. Every morning is Sunday morning when you're retired. I love that. <laughs> yeah, you know I do a lot. I'm very active in so many things, but um, I sometimes I feel like I'm still working full time because I'm still involved in YouthLink a little, and I'm still um, very active in Rotary more active than I could even imagine um, so I'm you know involved in a lot of things and of course grandkids grandkids are critical how old are your grandkids um, well my daughter's kids are 11 and 7 so how cute is that I love that oh they're just the joy they really are the joy of my life they're amazing now you have one daughter correct I only have one kid okay so um, but she's 38 so that's not exactly a child anymore. yeah no well, she'll always be your child Always, but you know, it's interesting that um, as children grow up, you know, you, you develop different relationships with them. I, I feel more, I've really tr worked hard to suppress my um, feeling that uh, I'm her mom and more that I'm her friend, you know, because I think as you become a full grown adult, if your parents still treat you like you're a kid it's insulting in a little bit of a way you for know? sure because you know you're a full-grown adult you have your own life and you know work and family and you have to be really you know it was it's been an interesting journey do you feel like the grandkids have brought you closer as to my daughter yeah uh, yes at now at the beginning I was I don't know if other people feel this way but when my daughter had a baby I felt like oh my gosh how can this 13 year she was like 27 years old I was like how can this 13 year old take care of an infant yeah. you know <laughs> I mean I went immediately to her being a kid yeah you know and I think that was a very testy time because it's hard when you first have kids and then to have your mother kind of I never said it but I I in retrospect looking back I think I was treating her like she was like she couldn't handle it. That's the mother thing to do. It's I mean, the mother thing to do, and it took a while, you know, with the second child, second grandchild. And I think now we have a really nice relationship where we're really, I mean, I'm her mom, and she'll call me to cry and call me to ventilate and stuff like that, but really I'm more like a, a trusted, extremely trusted friend. Yeah, you're, and I think you're that's a, good a nice, that's a better way to be with a 38 year old daughter than treating her like she's a little kid so I like that so every day yeah. is Sunday so what are you still doing with you <clears throat> though well you know I was the board chair for I'm gonna be stepping down as board chair in the fall I needed to do one last thing and that was to reorganize the board so that a lot of times in nonprofits especially startup nonprofits people are running so fast and that's the way I was you know and the organization's growing and people are being attracted to it and coming on board to help and you're just so busy that you you know you don't have time you need a governing board but you don't know exactly what to do with a governing board and you don't have time to make their lives 
as a board member, as productive and as um, worthwhile to the organization as you wish you could. So that was my final task, you know, and I've worked on that with the board and with Justin, um, the new executive director, <clears throat> for the last two years, and we've got it really knocked. And our board is so productive right now and so engaged and so meaningful to the organization. So it's not like just on a need to know or I need to ask basis, which is the way it was for a really long time. The board is very engaged and there's a job description for every member and people feel they're really contributing not just money, but also they're doing things. You so know? what are the challenges that you <clears throat> face like with the nonprofit? I mean, is raising money your biggest oh, hurdle? You know, you, you, I started a nonprofit, so it's very different than someone who comes on board For a nonprofit sure. that's established. So, you know, I've had so many people, um, I've had, without exaggeration, well over 100 people and maybe more. I don't know. I'm just being conservative come to me and say how do you how'd you start a nonprofit you know I I stopped even talking to those people after a while because it it's just not a pleasant story <laughs> <laughs> no startup story you know pleasant. I mean? everyone's like overnight it's, success you it's know? not and pleasant and to to bring people down like that when they were enthusiastic you know is, don't do it like <laughs> get yeah. out now well I would start to say that you know the thing yeah, I would say to people would be like, okay, you want to start a nonprofit? Are you good making absolutely no money for your like five years? Because and and not being thanked, no appreciation. Yeah. Like yeah, just, and just working like seven days a week, fourteen hours a day, but making no money. Are you good with that? Because that's like my initial question. So and people would be like, no, that that doesn't happen. I'm like, yeah, it does. Yeah, it's a great like, question that's, to ask. That's the way it happens. And don't think that you know you're going to be the exception because you're not. You know, you work really hard and you don't have that much to show for it for a while. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, then things start picking up. But it's a tough, every small business. For sure. You know, most small businesses don't last five years. And it's the same thing with nonprofits. So it's a very rocky neighborhood. There's all these like little drainage pipe areas. This so is you a might, beautiful time of year. <clears throat> I, I love this If you this go area. up higher, you'll probably like go up higher in the cove. Okay. Um, but it's such a windy, windy thing. But yeah. So, um, what it, what was the question about nonprofits? The, the hardest part about it. I mean, I I would. F the hardest part about it for me was um, not fundraising. We were very fortunate in that the business model for YouthLink was sustainable. You know, in other words, to this day, the service here supports itself on program fees. So People that don't know about YouthLink, like what is the business model? Like what is YouthLink? Well, YouthLink is um, a nonprofit that's dedicated to creating lifetime humanitarians through local and international service. And the local service piece has always been the part that has raised the most money or attracted the most attention or engaged the most people because every student does 80 hours of local service right here in Utah. They become um, very, you know, engaged in helping because they're a relied upon volunteer. So, you know, they make a difference. I mean, I think last year it was like 28,000 hours of wow. service. Just in one service year, 28,000 yeah. hours of relied upon, you know, guaranteed you show up, you make a difference, volunteers in well, this state. It really gets kid in, kids in that mindset too of volunteering. It like. Um, it's not just mom and dad can write a check and, and get them going on a cool safari trip. They're, right. They're, they're, they're mentally engaged in the process of service before they even, you know, go overseas to do their exactly. projects. Exactly. And we make sure of that. And the fact that they must do the service before they go, you know, we've only kicked four people out and we've had like 4,000 participants. It's ridiculous. I love that you've kicked people out though. You know, like, <laughs> we did kick four people as out. As you should. But that was early on, and it was like, you know, a real message that we're serious. And, you know, it was March, and, you know, the trips were leaving in three months, and they hadn't done any service. So there was really no catch-up time. You know, they couldn't yeah. do all that service in those few remaining months. So that's the way it is. But, you know, I think the message is received, and if someone's going to drop out of the service here, they're going to do it kind of towards the beginning now because they realize we're serious about this mm -hmm. we're not kidding 
you come to the planning meeting, you plan your international service, you do the local service, or you don't go. You know, so people know it, and we don't have a lot of fallout later on in the year anymore. I mean, there are a few kids that get sick or have a horrible tragedy. In and their what family. are these kids doing in country? Um, well, as you know, we have many, many committees. So um, there's a construction committee because we always build something. But mm -hmm. as you know, there's not a lot of pre prep on that. I know that was a struggle for your family. Yeah. There's just not a lot of pre prep. It's caveman construction. It's yeah, very archaic. You know, wood and nails and you know rocks and mortar. Um, <clears throat> it's not like we're doing HVAC in these these buildings. <laughs> no, you're building you a know, structure. For really very simple. Shelter. <laughs> very very simple. So there's always something that we're building. Generally a schoolhouse, but it can be other things like a first aid station or a community small I might say community center I'm talking about a place where people can meet where they're not going to get rained on I'm not talking about a you know Olympic swimming pool so um, you know those kinds of things and then we do um, always education um, which engages our students with the community we're always doing uh, um, vocational training we're doing first you know first line medical instruction those kinds of things so we're doing stuff like that and we're doing I'm leaving things out I always forget oh we do a thing that's like a called a cultural conversation now which we didn't do but probably happened organically when you were involved Dave um, so we structure it more where students prepare to do these kind of conversations with families sometimes obviously with a translator but just kind of getting to know what life is like in that I village like that. much more in depth you know, like family histories and, you know, the way they live and how they make a living and if they travel outside that village or not, you know, those kinds Yeah, there's of such things. a cultural difference. Inf infant mortality. <clears throat> you know, it's pretty brutal to, you know, see that half the kids under five are dying. Oh my gosh. It's, you know, it's, it's such an eye opener when you get over there. Yeah. Um, you still doing microloans? We don't do that as much. We're much more geared towards the vocational training. Okay. We do some loans if the team raises some money for it, but we're not trying to repay them. Got it. Okay. So that is too hard. We really tried and it just became too hard to track it. And it yeah, was too much work for our in-country coordinators and it kind of burned them out trying to do that so now we'll give a $50 or $100 loan but we're not really expecting it to be repaid it's for people who've been very involved in the vocational training and also the business lessons because we do that too so we'll do basic accounting basic marketing those kinds of things so for people who are super involved and show up every day and have a good business plan we will do a small loan not every country but often so yeah but that's the service here and what about, I mean, what is this whole process of YouthLink, and I know you were a teacher before that, like this life of service, like what has that meant to you over the years? You know, Dave, I saw that question on your list and I was like, my goodness, you know, I never even think about that. Um, yeah, it was your but life. But now I started to think about it because of your question. So I was thinking, you know, it's not like I planned to do this. You know, my whole life, I I have been a helper, you know, like mm -hmm. I, when I see when I see a need, I try to help. So it hasn't been something that I was like, you know, by golly, I'm going to have a life of service. You know, I that really wasn't it. I mean, it's just who I am, I guess. So I, I've kind of thought about it because of your question. I, I just kind of do things when I see a need and I don't know why. It's like an impulse, you know, yeah, and Youth Link was an impulse. I mean, it wasn't something that I planned on doing. I had no idea it would end up this big. I seriously thought it would be a cool thing to do, like maybe while I was teaching, to take a group in the summer, to help in Kenya. I never thought it would get this out of hand. <laughs> you know, where it got so gigantic, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's almost two million in and out of this organization every year now. That's Which amazing. Is huge. It's huge. So I don't know how, I really don't know how it all happened, but I just kept putting my head down and I think it's because you loved it. I mean, to, you could see when you were at those fundraisers and in those meetings, like this was your child. Like you, you put your whole heart into this I thing. I really felt like it was my child for a really long time, but it became so many other people's child 
So it, I, I couldn't do it all, and I had to farm my kid out to many people. <laughs> so Youth Lake has so many parrots. I mean, I might be the ultimate ancestor, but you know, so the many tribe people. Mother. I don't know. I don't even think I'm that anymore because there are plenty of kids who are well. I mean, especially over the last two years, they don't even know who I am. You know, and that's fine with me. Yeah, I don't mind that. In fact, that's wonderful because it's growing. They're committed. They're they're involved. I, you know, a lot. Of, there's a lot of research because in the transition, we did a lot of research that says that founders have a hard time letting go. You know, I really didn't. It was just a joy to me to see that other people were so engaged and wanting to be part and and take really huge parts of it and work their tail off you know I mean it's we have nine and a half employees now love that <laughs> from all volunteers so you know that's full time it's For crazy sure. you know so it's really it's grown and then the volunteers of course are legion and it's pretty crazy um, so anyway you can go over there if you want yeah let's go straight <clears throat> so anyway I don't think there's any construction down there right now but that's the way I feel about it. I mean, I've, it has not been, you know, because there was always so much work and because I'm a delegator right from the beginning, even with volunteers, I would always say, well, why don't, you know, that's a great idea. Why don't you do that? Mm -hmm. You know, so people, and that's the whole structure of the service here. That's why the students have work to do because I've all, you know, that's the whole plan is like everybody needs to be working because there's a lot of work to do. So, I started cutting huge swaths of youth link off very early because there was no way I could do it by myself. For sure. Yeah. I yeah. mean, there's no way. Yeah. So it's a good thing. I think it's a good model. And the business model is basically just, you know, all the participants, I think it's still in the low 700s per person to participate. That's their fee. Oh, okay. And that supports really the whole operation. Because the program's so big, we had 450 participants. It's an yeah. interesting business model. It's really sustainable. <laughs> Very um, sustainable. So to grow, we just have to open new sites. Now, granted, there are other portions of YouthLink that are sponsored through grants that have nothing to do, you know, like mm -hmm. all the other activities that YouthLink does, grant-based. But the service year, the core business model is based on the service year and the small, really small fee. Because most international service organizations charge twice that much for fees. And there's no service involved. <clears throat> and there's no service involved for the participant. Now, are you the only one or were you the first one to do that or both? To do what? To, to incorporate the service and the last third has to be paid by a sponsor. and Nobody else does that in this state. I've never heard of anything like YouthLink anywhere. And I've looked. I love that. Yeah. That's what's so unique so about the So it's a very program. unique organization, and so many people <clears throat> want to grow it outside the state, but I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of averse to it right now because I feel that we need to, oh, you know, we had a transition, and I don't know if Justin's in a place right now where he can grow it out of the state. I think what would have to happen would be an entire expansion team to do something like that. Yeah, but what would be the purpose of expanding it out of state? A lot of people think it's such a good thing and it do, it's so great for kids that it should be other places. And I'm all I'm all about that, but I also don't want to lose the quality of what we're doing here. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. And sometimes <clears> that <throat> intimacy is what keeps um, the core values really intact. Right. So to replicate it, it's not a question of the curriculum or the... Um, you know, it's a high-touch organization, so it's not really a question of do we have it all, all of our ducks in a row? Could we, could we sustain it and replicate it? Yes, but it would take a number of really committed people to do that. Mm -hmm. In other words, it would take a whole other team of people, not just one person trying to do that, but a whole team of people trying to do that. So that's in the future. I don't think Justin wants to do that. I know the board doesn't want to do that. So we'll just see what happens. You know? Do you get excited like knowing how many people's lives you've It's amazing of, to me. I can't wrap my head around like it. Like in country and out of country. Because <clears throat> like, you know, for someone like me, um, the whole course of my life was changed because of YouthLink. Oh. Um, and you know that. I mean, I started I a business that lasted 10 years and it yeah. would never have happened without YouthLink. And I'm one of 
what, 2,000 plus kids that have gone on these trips? Well, more than that now. I think it's somewhere closer to four. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so who knows who else is out there that like, whether they started a business or they're, like you said, I mean, you're creating lifelong humanitarians. Yeah. And so, um, well, it's been incredibly impactful, not just for students and adults who mentor the students in Utah, but also, you know, we have eight sites now. I know, I was looking at your website. That's it's incredible. Insane. So eight developing countries where we work with Rotary Clubs and nonprofits to really change small villages. And that small village model is so important because, you know, if you if you have a collaborative team going somewhere and you don't have a collaborative team that's working with them, it doesn't work. Uh -huh. I mean, the people, it has to be a small village. It can't be a school. It can't be, you know an orphanage or something and a lot of nonprofits do that but if you're gonna make real sustainable change we know from not just research but just from the field that you know firsthand that you have to do things like clean water secondary education um, first-line medical care access to first-line medical care and vocational training then you lift people up I mean that's the that's the bottom line but you have to have a community that's willing to pull together and continue that process after the team leaves how do you find these sites I mean is it all through Rotary Clubs um, you know <clears throat> we used to find them all through Rotary Clubs but we have recently and this is in the last three four years been working with small nonprofits in country that have their act together and have the same model we do as far as best practice international development so we find the smaller nonprofits are doing a better job of that than the very large nonprofits basically because their overhead is lower uh -huh. <laughs> so I mean the people are more invested in the communities they're working with so when you get a very large nonprofit it's very difficult to maintain that in the village feeling you know working mm -hmm, in the for village. sure so it just gets to be more of a let's drop some stuff off and move on, kind of like large nonprofits do. So, so as you've like, so as you've stepped down, um, you know, ninety percent, and you're ma making your way out of the chair, um, do you miss it? I mean, are are you? Are... No, no, I don't miss it at all. Not even a tiny bit. <laughs> okay, Dave, I know I the feeling. I know the feeling. So hard. Yeah. I mean, I was putting in without, and people think I'm exact. I was putting seven days a week 14 hours a day for 17 years I mean I did have an occasional break but that's what I did and I I don't miss that I mean I really want someone else to share that joy but I also wanted that to share that joy <laughs> I know, but I also wanted to leave youth link in a place where no one had to do that no one had to work that hard. yeah well that's so and that is the, the truth torch. today I mean Justin probably the executive prob the executive director probably works harder than other people but he doesn't work what I was working and I didn't want well, he didn't to build it from nothing anyone he, he to do that took over a two right. million dollar organization exactly so I didn't want anyone to have that horror story in their life you know because it was something that uniquely suited to a founder who wanted to work that hard you know to make it go but I wanted to make sure it wasn't in that spot when I left yeah because that would that's not sustainable well, no, that's no not a one's gonna work as hard as me you know no one's gonna work as hard as a founder because they're not the founder so you can't leave it that I mean it was very important to me to leave it in a position that was sustainable which it is which is great that's great I mean that's so, that's what you worked for yeah you know and so many other things yeah true so how are you staying busy these days um so let's see so it's been really nice to have every morning be a Sunday morning you know, I feel like I'm still productive in my volunteer enterprises, but I just start later and I don't feel as oppressed. You know, like, yeah. oh my gosh, I got to get this done today because tomorrow there's all this other stuff I have to do. So I'm um, very busy with grandkids. I, I go to Sac Sacramento at least a week a month to babysit or just oh, to I be love there. That. John, my husband and I bought a condo there, and so that's been fantastic. Yes, I mean, it's really beautiful weather there. And it's just a nice community. Sacramento is a very, it reminds me a lot of Utah in a lot of ways, you know, because it's very laid back. It's kind of, you know, kind of, kind of relaxed, but mm -hmm. also it's, it's a kind of a granola-y community. 
Utah is not necessarily granola. <laughs> you know, it's more I would, democratic. Let's just put it that I way. I would think Utah is a It's not granola-y. a conservative community. Some parts of it are, but um, Utah can be more conservative. And I so you, it's, yeah. I enjoy, you know, the idea of a liberal progressive community for a lot of reasons. Primarily that I'm not as, a, I don't have to be as afraid of what I say. And the political repercussions of that mm-hmm. statement, which is very true in Utah, you feel more like if you're a public person, you have to walk on eggshells a little bit more. Well, nowadays too, everything's just such a sensitive topic. You yeah. got to really be. Everyone has to be careful. I mean, everyone it, has to be. It'd careful. be tough to be a <clears throat> a face in today's society of you know stature that you're always being watched. Yeah, so that's nice because now that I'm not. The executive director of Youth Link, I can be a little more. You can say open. what you want. I can say what I want, <laughs> and not that I didn't before, but I think everyone knew I was a Democrat. But whatever, life goes on. So um, they still liked me. <laughs> 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 I guess I was doing good, right? Yeah. So it was, it was okay. Um, let's see. So then I do that. I'm very involved in, uh, um, you know, I do. I'm doing some things for Youth Link. I'll always do something for Youth Link. Youth Link's looking for a um, land for a building. Oh, they're moving, they're expanding. Yeah. So Love Justin that. and I and Jerrica um, are helping with that effort. We're What's a little, Jerrica do? Jerrica is now the International Service Director. Oh, good for her. But she has an assistant, so she has a little bit of time to dedicate towards this effort, and she wants to. I mean, she wanted to be part of that effort. Love Jerrica. So we're looking for land and and uh or a building to renovate it's too small i mean we've so seriously outgrown that office space yeah those so team meetings were tough. well we had some space next door but then the landlord took that away from us to rent it in this economy so we need a bigger space um so we're just cramped and it's just a nightmare with nine pe- nine and a half people in that office that we can't meet there anymore yeah, that is tough. So now we have to kind of farm out meeting spaces to libraries and schools. It's not, it's not cohesive. So that's a big thing. So I'm, I'm going to be involved in that uh, capital campaign. Okay. So that'll be good. First, finding a spot, and then the capital campaign, um, and then I'll be on the board. But I'm not going to be the board chair. I'm done uh, with high level leadership positions. I want it to be. It's a grown up. It's almost twenty. It needs to be on its own, right? Yeah, in so, dog years, it'd be 140. Exactly, exactly. So there's that, and then, uh, let's see, so then I do a lot with Rotary, District Rotary, Utah Rotary. Um, so I'll be the chief of staff for the incoming district governor in, tw- in July 2019, and that's already heated up. So I have a lot of stuff to do there. Um, I love Rotary. I love Utah Rotarians. They're just incredible What kind of projects is Rotary doing these days? Um, you know, we're trying to stay alive. That's bas- the basic thing, Dave. You know, Rotary's dying because, oops, sorry, because people who are Rotarians are senior citizens. Older than me, even. You know, in their 80s. You know, <laughs> Why is literally that? dying. Why is it such a. You know, Rotary um, lost its way, I think, uh, in. I don't know exactly how it lost its way. I think because it became too formal of a program, at least in this state. Um, I, I don't know in other states, and I know in other countries that's not the case. But it became a really formal kind of old white guys eating lunch organization yeah. instead of a vibrant networking, service-minded organization. And I think it kind of lost its way. It's just like it's, an archaic model? It's, that yeah, they have? it's like everybody gets together and eats lunch, lunch and listens to a speaker, which, you know, for younger people, 30-somethings, 40-somethings, they don't have the time for that, you know? They want to know, why am I spending this money to yeah. belong to this organization that just seems to sit around and listen to a speaker? You yeah, know? I've been to a couple of Rotary meetings, and there was one really cool speaker, but other than that, it was, like you said, I was, I, I was kind <clears> of... <throat> well, you should come to my Rotary Club. It's a after, after work... Rotary Club. It's a happy hour Rotary Club. Oh, I like happy hour. <laughs> and uh, we do so much service and socials and, you know, we, we don't have any formality at all. So it's kind of a younger, you know, younger group. <clears throat> Highly female. More than half, which is extremely unusual for Rotary. Yeah. It's mostly men. So we're a different sort of club, but that's the future, you know, and, and everyone, not just in Utah, but in the nation is trying to experiment with 
different ways to make it more meaningful for people in their 30s and 40s because otherwise rotary is going to die so that's probably the main the main driver is rotary of, as a whole <clears throat> in the organization worldwide is it is it's it, shrinking it is shrinking it's shrinking and that's too bad because it is the world's largest non-political non-religious service organization oh, it I does so much good worldwide I mean so much good but it won't do any good if it loses its membership and people don't want to belong you know we have to make the meetings we have to make when we meet and when we plan something that young people would like to be involved with yeah it's you know? it's tough I mean it can't be a checkbook club you know a lot of rotary clubs are checkbook clubs they write a check to support a project and they don't really get, get involved hands-on service is what young people are looking for that's what I love about youth link or any kind of service trip like that because there's so much money donated which mm -hmm. is which is fantastic don't get me wrong on that but um, to be involved in the project itself is so yeah. much more life-changing for, life for both partners <clears throat> the, right. the recipient and you know the giver yes exactly it is it is it's an it's an amazing thing so I know like we talked about this earlier but the, your grandkids are giving you joy but mm -hmm. is what are you finding other than the, your grandkids that gives you joy nowadays because I mean oh, when you give your whole well. life to service there's so much um, well, I don't, you know, here's the thing about joy, you know, in different parts of your life, you get different <clears throat> sources of joy. And so right this minute, you know, I mean, I like to work, I like to be engaged. So I think, you know, trying to reorganize the way Rotary is handled in this state, I wouldn't say it gives me joy, but it gives me purpose. Okay. And so I think purpose gives you joy. But I'll tell you right now what gives me joy, and this is just because I'm only two years into my retirement the fact that I don't have to work incredibly hard and the fact that my time is my own and the fact that I can you know relax yeah gives me in that I can visit with friends and that I can watch a television show how weird like <laughs> I never watched anything I had no time yeah you know so these are the things <clears throat> the fact that I can go travel with my husband on a business trip Instead of saying, yeah, I can't do that because I'm so busy. I mean, that gives me joy right now. So it's a very simple pleasure. It's what I planned for and what I was looking forward to is just having time to, to do what I wanted to do, not what I had to do. Has it helped a lot of your relationships and your friendships, your marriage, all that stuff kind of come closer? Well, it's really nice to have friendships with people you don't have to ask money. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, I mean, Touché. over the last 18 years, all of my friendships, I wouldn't say they were corrupted by it, but they were deeply yeah, influenced. Yeah, oh God, Judy's calling. Yeah, deeply influenced by the fact that I wasn't visiting with them only to visit with them. Yeah, no. You, you know, I was visiting with them because I needed money, and yeah. they knew it. God, you got to be so persistent. <laughs> And relentless in that business, like that. That's why I think well, it's crazy. It's crazy, like you, you, because your whole job, the whole organization, runs on other people's money. So to not ask my friends for money anymore has been so beautiful. I bet it's more beautiful for them. Yeah, I bet it's more beautiful for them. But it, <laughs> it is less like guilt feeling on my part and feeling like I'm manipulating people I love because I need their money. That's yeah. like not a good feeling. So that that is something that, you know, they didn't, they were always trying to put me at ease about it, you know, but I felt bad about it, that that was something I had to do for the organization yeah. to survive. So, you know, it is what it is, but it's, you know, it's a tough thing, but it, it I'm glad it's gone. <laughs> Did you have a core group of people that consistently donated to you? Yes. Like? Oh, yes. And you know what's really wonderful is they still give, even though I'm not the executive director. I love that. Isn't that wonderful? So I don't have to ask them, but no, I know I know that they're still giving. Have any I of them, them. experienced youth link? And yes. A, oh. So at this at this point, I don't have many friends who haven't been on a trip. Stacy and I <laughs> were talking a couple days ago. We're gonna take Ellen on a trip next summer. We're gonna apply. Oh, awesome! So I don't know where we're gonna. We're, we're thinking maybe South America to start. To Peru. We're only uh, in Peru. So. Or, or Central <clears throat> or Guatemala as well. Or Guatemala. Right? Um, but I think that's where we're gonna start. I don't know, but we we really want to take Ella and the three of us go. So oh, how awesome! Yeah, that'd be wonderful. So we'll, I think 
we'll apply in November. Well, it's an amazing it is. thing to do. I, you know, I do want to have my grandkids do it when they're old enough. You know, I think they're a little young right now, but um, yeah, because it is. They want to. They know all about it. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's such a unique organization. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's really. It's amazing. So. I love that. Yeah. So what else? I mean, who in these service trips? Has anybody touched you the most that like has really stuck with you that you keep in touch with or a specific moment that has really resonated with you over the years that kind of sparked, you know, <clears throat> well, the love? Well, you know, I was thinking about those questions because, you know, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about that. Um, it's just sort of part of your life. Yeah, you know? of course. So I was thinking about that. And, you know, here's the thing. So what was really unique for me, my experience was that I always got to go to a site first. And I think because we go to such remote villages where oftentimes people have never seen a white person, you know? Yeah. Literally. No, I know. Literally never seen a white person. And I was like the first white person they ever saw. I feel like I, um, I, I got a very unique experience from that, you know? like. Uh, it's not like I'm 40 people coming to stay for two weeks. Yeah. You know, I'm just one person. And so I got a really unique look at what, how people live and what their culture's like before you think, you know, because, you know, every time a culture hits a culture, the culture changes. It's just the way, you know, it's globalization, mm -hmm. right? So every time an immigrant comes to our country, they're changed, we're changed. Every time, and I believe for the best, you know, and every time we travel to another country, that country is impacted and we're impacted. Mm -hmm. So those people that we're interacting with, it's just the nature of human interaction, right? So the fact that I got to just interact with people in their, you know, they were just doing their lives. I think I got to see more of how people actually live without the circus of the 40 bus of people 40 kids. coming in and you know disrupting everything and it is it's like you know it's like everyone wants to come and see what we're doing and people come from far and wide so it was that was really unique was there ever a shock factor as um, a woman going into this well you know villages? probably but you know I'm I have the unfortunate um, trait of being very like I don't know I just like I just go places and do stuff and I don't I just I don't like it's a confidence. care, you yeah. know I mean I'm just there and and I maybe they are shocked but I'm just treating them like another person like I remember a really funny story I remember I was meeting a professor at Kenyatta University in Kenya and um, of course Kenyatta University is all Africans I mean everybody's black Right? Mm -hmm. So I remember going on that campus, and I've been on a lot of college campuses. It looked like a regular college campus to me. Maybe not as, you know, fancy, but, you know, it's a college campus. And people are walking around, and I was standing outside this professor's office, which was kind of in a building where there was a terrace. And I was just standing there because he wasn't there yet, and I was early. And uh, I remember everybody looking at me. And I was like, my gosh, I wonder what's wrong with me. Yeah. <laughs> like a lot. What, like what's wrong with me? Is my blonde skirt, hair? Yeah. Is my skirt tucked into my underwear or like you know, like yeah. something's wrong with my hair or, but then it just struck me, oh my gosh, I'm white. That's why they're all yeah. like Yeah. <laughs> Who's this woman here? <laughs> Who is this white white chick standing on the terrace? You know, we have, you know, they they're just usually not here. So I mean I had that kind of a okay, I'm here to do something to help and we're just gonna get to it kind of a attitude so I didn't like pause to necessarily consider that people might be shocked by my presence I had a lot to explain and a lot to lay out and you think it's a hard concept for most people to grasp. yes yeah, I agree you know so I had a, a lot to do in a little bit of time so I just kind of got to it but it was really nice to see you know how welcoming people are and and granted People have different, I mean, I have never been the first person in any of our Southeast Asia sites, but I understand they're as shy as the people are in Guatemala and um, Peru. Mm -hmm. People are very shy. You know, they, they are very reticent. That's their culture. They don't just, I mean, Kenyans are much more like Americans in that they're, hey, come on down. 
Yeah, you know, very curious. Very curious and friendly and smiling. Whereas people in Peru were much more circumspect and kind of like, what is she doing? You know, and holding back a lot more. But we have such good in-country coordination, it really wasn't a problem. But just being able to see families in their homes and, you know, meet them for the first time, first white person, you know, and just see how they're living and, you know, just kind of grasp their culture and what they're about and just it's really it humbling touching to really a deep extent so I don't know I think once the team came they may not have been as aware of that so I think that was a really unique now the roles are reversed they want your money <laughs> right right so it was a unique aspect of of what I got to do you know, and I mean, there's a million touching stories, Dave. I, you know, I don't yeah, of course. Like, need to like, I mean, we call them youth link stories because you know what they are. You know, at this point, we've had thousands of participants, and they all tell similar stories of their experience. So I've had those experiences too. Yeah, you it, know what I mean. So right. my stories are really no different than anyone else's stories. It's really interesting when you go for the <laughs> second, third, fourth time, and you see everyone else for the first time. And the excitement of their, oh my gosh, look at that, look at that, you know, <clears throat> this happened, and you're like, yeah, that's just life in Kenya. It's the way it is, and, you know. But, you know, we were those people too for the first time, and yeah, exactly. it just kind of, um, it's, I hate to say the word, but you kind of become numb to it almost. Well, almost like it's not numb, it's just familiar. You know, that, okay, this is the way it is, these people live in a mud hut, they only sleep in there, you yeah. know, they've got, you know, a dying child in there you know I mean yeah and it's there's like, not there's nothing you can do well, unfortunately. there's really nothing that I can do and if I try to do something I'm probably gonna screw it up really massively because you can't just start air flighting out you know yeah kids with serious birth defects you I give mean, everyone what is going to happen for sure you know and over time I've I've tried just like everyone else involved in in youth link to like change the life of a child okay I'm just here to tell you that it doesn't work because this it's like well it's to give the man a fish type exactly. scenario exactly well I mean even the the problems like for example one time oh there was a street kid hanging out outside of our hotel in Kenya and he kept hanging out and hanging he was like a little lost puppy you know little stray dog and he was a really cute kid filthy but darling little kid he's probably 11 okay and he just wanted to you know, maybe he wanted to beg or maybe he just wanted to watch. I don't really know what he wanted, but he would not be, he would not be dissuaded. He wanted to sit outside this hotel. Now, he didn't speak English and I didn't speak his uh, dialect. Um, I think it was Kikuyu. He didn't even speak Swahili, which I spoke a little bit of. Mm -hmm. But I could not, no one could get him to leave and he was there. So finally, I started inquiring. Well, he happened to be a glue sniffing addict because yeah, that's, that's what they do. suppressed hunger. And he had been forever. And no one knew who his family was. He didn't even know. Okay, so he was just a street kid. And so I had him taken in to a street home. But he had serious brain damage. And he kept running away. So then the people in this, in this you know, home for street kids had to continuously be chasing him because Judy of YouthLink had a special interest in this child. So they were spending half their life chasing this kid all over Kenya because he kept running away. They tried to get him a job. He just didn't have the brain power to get a, to have a job. So what am I going to do? Yeah, what are Finally, you Finally, after two years of this, the people in the home said, Judy, could we just please be let off the hook? Because <laughs> we can't find him. You know? Yeah. And so, like, really, people don't realize how hard it is to do things until they see how hard it is in these villages. It's so easy to think it can be done from <clears throat> a world away here no. in the U.S. And it really, I mean, we have so many problems in this country that aren't being solved. Right. But, I mean, what Youth Link does is more community-based. So we're trying to lift up the whole community instead of just focusing on one person. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, and then another thing I tried to do was get people say, oh, you wanna have girls go to high school. Okay, so I did this early on and it was my own little project. It, just like this street kid, it had nothing to do with youth link. 
but I tried to work with a woman in, in Kenya who worked for um, United Nations Children's Fund to try to get young women through high school. All right, so I had, again, <clears throat> everyone I knew and everyone on my, my block sponsoring a girl to go to high school. Mm -hmm. $250 a year, that's what it cost. It was really doable for most of my friends. But the hard part became when my friend in Kenya was telling me, well, so-and-so, she got pregnant. And she got pregnant by the principal. <laughs> oh my God. Really? And so she's gonna drop out of school, you know? So then I have to go to my neighbor and say, well, your girl is no longer in school because she got pregnant by the principal. Or I would have to tell people that a girl dropped out of school because the principal was sexually harassing her, was trying to get her to sleep with him. Like this is the normal stuff that happens. Again. Yeah, of course. You know, or I'd have to tell someone, you know, well, the father died of HIV and the mother has 11 kids. And so this girl has got to go home and help. So she's not going to go to school. So it's not as easy as people want to think it is. It's not like it's some kid in your neighborhood. And that's that a very sending. common occurrence too. Yes. So, you know, there's all kinds of things that are happening that we can't even imagine would be happening that are keeping girls from being in school. It's not just money. You know. No, it's, it's not money just is not money. the problem or the solution. Yeah, it's not it's not always. So, it was a valiant effort and I at one point had like 25 girls being sponsored, but I'd say fewer than half made it through. So the success rate was so low <laughs> that I was just like getting tired of having to tell people, you know, uh oh, well, this girl didn't make it. And it was, they would look at me like, are you crazy? What, why did you ask me for money for this when you knew that? But I didn't know. Yeah. I learned. So then I said, oh, I'm not going to do it anymore. It's just too hard. I don't want to have those conversations anymore. You know, not that there aren't organizations that maybe can make it successful, but little me trying to do that, it wasn't going to work. Well, and people, when they go there too, they, they all, someone touches each individual down there. And when they come back, they want to do the same thing. And right. I was in touch with a couple of kids that sponsored um, in same scenario, you know, like just um, dad left and they had the, the boy to take care of the family or it's like you know, impossible it's just it's really hard and so it's hard to you know, break I out had that our in-country coordinator in, in Kenya once tell me because I was fretting about these things so much and we were having lunch and he's like you know this was a long time ago he probably told me this like five years in four years in to youth link he said you know Judy you're just gonna have to let people live their Kenya lives Ooh, I like you that. know, yeah. It's like you know, you cannot influence their lives. You have to just yeah. let them live them. Someone said that to us <laughs> the first in a team meeting. Like uh, Becky had a friend from Kenya come to us, and she said the same thing. Like, don't think that you're going to go change the world or these people's lives. You're there for two weeks to help make a difference mm -hmm. in that moment and spark a and little change. And hopefully, the and... community will own it. Correct. You know, and so then that and that that's why you think looks for communities that will own it and have demonstrated that they will do something like where it is now Dave is you think doesn't even go to a community until they've shown some gumption to help themselves like until they're doing something whatever it whatever little teeny tiny bit they can pull together to do we just wouldn't go yeah they, Cause they have to have a demonstrated commitment to help themselves correct. they got to do more than just take your money collaboratively you know, like everyone's on board and we're all doing this. You know what I mean? For sure. So that's really important, I think, in international development. And I'm not sure that's always done. I mean, there are some really high level solutions, you know, like for example, malaria or um, deworming kids, you know, that organizations do that really benefit everyone, you know, mm -hmm. it's wonderful. I'm not saying that's not great, it's wonderful, but if you have a small organization that's, whose goal is to create lifetime humanitarians through those engagement you know, activities, you have to have a small community that's willing to pull themselves up so that your efforts are sustainable. And I'm really, I don't know if I mentioned this, but you know, we have had so many, not only teams go back, but outside groups 
through Rotary, oh, really? not through Gro Rotary. Yeah, report to us on villages that we have haven't been in for ten years. That are like, oh, everything you did there is still. Yeah, I was rocking. wondering that. How, are oh, you yeah. in touch with people? That no, are... it's wonderful because sometimes you know we self-report that we go back to the village, but that's the organization self-reporting, you mm -hmm. know. But to have outside organizations say, you know, like for example, the Rotary Club of Salt Lake had a team to Cambodia. I've I've been to Cambodia, but not to our sites. Um, and then a random Rotarian called me and said, you know, I visited your sites that you have you know haven't been to for seven years they are still rocking I mean everything youth link contributed is there and the the village has stepped it up and increased the standard of living for that village and he said you know but other villages that other organizations came by that's not the same thing Interesting. so isn't that wonderful yeah I think it's I think it's a good it's, it's gonna a make good you happy idea. yeah it makes me you... delighted I mean obviously I'm delighted about it. I can't even believe it I can't even believe that it's happened. But again, you know, people will come up to me and say, it's a wonderful thing you've done. And I have trouble saying yeah to that because I didn't do even, you know. It's a team effort. You know, 5% or 3% of anything, you know. So it's a huge team effort. Yeah, so. you laid all the, the stones for everybody to kind of walk exactly. over. And yeah. um, you did a really good job at it, too. Well, I worked hard, you know, and I had a lot of help. Let's put it that way. So, it takes good help. It takes a lot of wonderful people, and Youth Link attracts incredible people like you. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, You're it's welcome. it's full circle that and your fam. Here we are. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So now that you're retired. Now that you're enjoying life, what's one thing you wish you had done? Um, now Nothing. that you feel like you're too oh, old well, to do. No, I don't feel like there's anything I'm too old to do. I mean, the one thing that I wish I had done in my life, and this was, this is advice, you know, I really think that for whatever reason, I was put here on this earth to mentor young people. I really feel like that's, that's my great, goal. That's a great calling. I mean, I always did it. I did it as a teacher. I did it through YouthLink. And there's so many YouthLinkers that I stay in touch with and who I just met for breakfast with one of them this week, I mean, it's a normal thing, that want to talk to me about their careers. And I would say, if I had any regret in my life, it was that I was born at the time I was born, and the, the, when I was young, the avenues for women to make a difference in the world were very limited. You know, you're basically a teacher, a nurse, or a secretary. Yeah. And so I became a teacher, you know. I mean, I did become a journalist, journalists didn't make enough to live on so that's unfortunate that's a tough career yeah it's, but it's a good career but it's a tough one um, especially in this state they make nothing but bottom line is that I wish I had been born at a time when I could have had um, immediately um, a larger more impactful career now I did with YouthLink but that was later in life mm -hmm. you know so I feel like I did that I just wish it was earlier so I could have had more longevity in doing that, you know, more energy in doing that. But I am really happy with my life. When I saw that, you know, I have done so much. I, I can't even imagine one thing other than that that I would change. Have you stepped back to look at what you've done and really reflect on all the accomplishments and the hard work? Because sort I know those of, 17 yeah. years just kind of blur together. Well, and then also, you know, teaching was really rewarding too. So I can't say, you know, I taught teachers, I taught kids. You know, I that was really rewarding. You think it was an accident, you know. I mean, I wasn't like sitting around planning. You think it just kind of happened. So it just grew and grew and grew, and people were attracted to it, and it happened. But I really don't think I have any regrets, and I don't think there's anything that I feel that I'm too old to do. I mean, I do want to do some more traveling, not just in the world, but also in the U.S. Because mm -hmm. I haven't seen a lot of the U.S weirdly you know I've seen the East Coast and the West Coast and but not all of it and so I feel like there's some things I'd like to see and do and I don't have any physical limitations fingers crossed so I feel like I can do that good so no really no I mean I'm very fortunate because a lot great. of people have a lot more regrets than me well, I mean I'll tell you the way I'm put together Dave is that I I don't regret a mistake like a lot of people regret mistakes. I have made billions, maybe not billions, but I've made hundreds 
literally hundreds of mistakes and at least a couple of dozen serious mistakes mm -hmm. in my life. We all like, have. Really bad. Well, like, being a human. oh my gosh, is that a bad mistake? But my philosophy, and I don't know who taught me this because I don't think anyone did. My philosophy is that, you know, I, even though I might be incredibly depressed and very like in pain, I always take it as like, okay, what can I learn from this? Exactly. That's and what how, can I do better the next time? That's how it should be. You know, because if you don't do that, then you have all these regrets because you did things that you regretted doing, but you never, you know, learn from them to make the best of them. Mm -hmm. So I will say this, I rarely make the same mistake twice. It's hard for me yeah, to Yeah, you learn from your mistakes. Because I really spend time debriefing myself and talking openly to others about that mistake mm -hmm. so that I know what I did and so I'll never do it again. So, yeah. I love it, Judy. Okay, well, thank you. This is... This has been great. It's been like five plus years since I've seen you. I know. You look great. You look great. And all grown up. Give me a hug. Oh. <laughs> oh. Thank you, Judy. All right. Well, thank you. When do I get to see it? Uh, this is going to go live. Who edits this? I edit it. Oh, awesome. So, will you do that? I will. I She's Judy Zone. I'm David Windsor. This is Beyond Great with David James. Thanks for watching.